say, well, that's where Jesus was, but why did God choose a manger? Maybe he could have chose a table or a basket or a, a bowl or a, uh, any kind of other device to have his son laid in, but God in his infinite wisdom didn't choose any of those. He chose a manger. And we look in various scriptures here, all in Luke, we can see it says, And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in clothes and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And it emphasizes again in verse 12, And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. And then verse 16, And they came in a hurry and found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. So it's pretty specific that God wanted us to know that not only did he send his son to be born, he makes it clear over and over again of where the baby was placed in a manger. I think that's important for all of us to take note. Obviously, he wasn't born with, in a five-star hotel or in a palace. He was the king of all kings, but God chose him not only to be in a stable, but to be placed specifically in a manger. You know, if you think about what a manger is, a manger is just a feed trough. It's a place where feed is placed. And not only did he place him in a manger, he had him in a city named Bethlehem, which means house of bread. You think God's trying to give us a message? He said, I want my son placed in a trough where feed, nutrition, is placed because he will be your nutrition. He will be your food. He will be all you need for substance. And I'm going to put him in a city. And I want that city to be called house of bread, place of nutrition. Matter of fact, Jesus even spoke of himself. He said, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. And he who comes to me will not hunger. And he who believes in me will never thirst. Are we getting the message? That God's saying, I'm putting him in a feed trough. I'm putting him in a city called House of Bread and I'm going to refer to him and when he speaks, he'll call himself the Bread of Life. Those three instances are not coincidental. God has a message in a message. Yes, Christ has been born. Christ will live and Christ will die for our sins. But from the very beginning, God did not want us to miss this point. This Jesus will be and should be what each of you hunger most. What you hunger most in life. It's amazing what Job said in all of his trials. He had so many trials, but he said this, I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Job could not come up with a better phrase to tell how much he wanted to hear God's word than to say, I want to hear it more than I want my necessary food. Now, I don't know about you, many of you know Tim Strickland well. My necessary food is necessary food. And nothing, I don't believe, that when God created appetite, hunger, there's in our bodies, all of us can relate to being hungry. And when Job mentioned it here about how much he longed for God's word, and when God himself placed Jesus in this feed trough in a house of bread city, I think he was telling us that we know what hunger is, and I want you to have that same kind of passion for my son. Now some people may say, you know what, I, I'm just not very passionate about the Lord. You hear people say this, you know, God's just not a real high priority in my life right now. You know, I've never heard this statement before in my life. 
eating is really not a high priority on my life this year. I've never heard that. Matter of fact, some people say, I'm not going to get real fanatical about Jesus. I mean, all those people in church reading the Bible and doing all that stuff, just so fanatical. But I've never heard anybody say that eating three meals a day was fanatical. Why? Because we have this hunger for food. And God's saying, make your number one hunger my son. And I'm going to show that in symbolism by when he's born, the place I'm going to choose to put him is in a feed trough for you to know that you should hunger after him more than you hunger after anything else in life. I believe as we look at this manger in our life, as we even at Christmas time begin to look at the manger, I hope it makes us think of several things in our life about our spiritual hunger. Now, I don't have to preach this morning about physical hunger, because you may be counting the minutes down to lunch. It seems like physical hunger comes naturally, but we're going to find out that spiritual hunger after you're born again should come naturally as well. Let's look at some things that when we look at the manger, we should see that hunger for Christ and His will comes when we're born again. Matter of fact, it starts out with tasting. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. You ever heard anybody, you know, they had a good meal and say, you know, I don't know if I want that or not. And they'll say, well, just... Taste it. Now, tasting it really doesn't constitute eating a meal. It just constitutes whether I want to eat the meal. See, a lot of people taste Jesus, but they never get saved. They've heard it in a revival. They've heard it at church. They heard it in Sunday school. They've tasted it, but they've never really eaten it. That's what Hebrews talking about when it talks about, that, about those who's tasted it but they never come to know Christ. See, by tasting the Lord, in other words, I've heard it and I've tasted it, but it's really not for me. That flavor may be for you, but it's not for me. But you know what happens when you take a bite of something and you say, woo give me some of that. That's good stuff. Serve it to me. And boy, you just whip it up, man. Your knife and fork's got sparks going. That's the difference in lost people and saved people. Saved people tasted Jesus and say, that's good. I need a Savior. I want to commit my life to Christ from here to the day I die. That's good stuff. And other people have tasted and say, that's all right. It's all right. Not really much for me. And their life has never changed. Because all they've done is taste. And to them, they must have came up with the conclusion... For me, it's not that good because if it's good, it hungers you to pursue the Lord for the rest of your life. You know what kind of meal that is. You've got your favorite restaurants. You go back there all the time. Or you ask your spouse or your parents, you'll make that meal again. Because I've tasted it and eaten it. Once I've eaten it, boy, it sure is. It's good stuff. Matter of fact, Nicodemus. When Jesus ministered to Nicodemus, he said, you must be, what, born again. What's being born again? Well, Nicodemus was born once out of his mother's womb. But when we're born physically, mark it down. You're dead spiritually. That's why we go to hell. Why? Because we're dead spiritually. You can't go into heaven dead spiritually. But you can be born again, which is a second birth which is a spiritual birth, and once you're born again, you have spiritual life, and therefore, heaven can be your home. You see, that's why Peter spoke about the newborn babies long for pure milk of the word so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. See, once, uh, once that doctor, which I don't know if they still do this, I don't know if they spank them on the bottom anymore or not, but, you know, they get them crying, and from then on, the crying is usually for one thing, food. 
That's what they're crying for mainly, food. They don't know the word food. So they cry for food. Why? Because that's a good sign that you've been born. Physically, is that you have an appetite. And when you're born again, that's a good sign you've been born again. You have a spiritual appetite now. See why the Lord made it so easy to understand? He gives the analogy of birth to say once you're born physically, you have this innate thing in your body, even from the very day you're born, to cry and hunger for food. And he says it'll be the same thing spiritually. Once you're born again, there'll be something innately in you that hungers for the things of God that you may have not ever hungered for before in your life. Maybe religious things, but not for spiritual things. And that's where he comes to Nicodemus about being born again. And that's where he talks about here the milk of the word. You see, later on, Paul will talk about the meat of the Word, or Peter will talk about the meat of the Word. Why? Because babies start with milk and they end up growing up and eating meat and some other good things. Same way with being a Christian. You see, that manger symbolizes something about hunger. My son's in a feed trough. Do you hunger after him? Or can you just pass him up? Well, when you're born again, that's what you do to hunger. I was ministering one time to a member and they were um, discussing how this one relative, they just couldn't get him to read his Bible, they couldn't cut him, get him to come to church, they couldn't get him to do anything spiritual, they just was frustrated, so frustrated. And I said, you know, you should keep inviting, keep encouraging, but you have to remember, until you're born again, you'll never hunger the things of the Lord. You can be forced to and prodded to and, you know. But I don't know about you, but I can't think of very many times I've been prodded to eat. Just kind of comes naturally. And spiritually it comes supernaturally to hunger after the things of God. And so the encouragement with him was keep praying for his salvation. Because then, you know, either something's happened or he's never, if it's never happened, then he's never hungered for the things of God. You know, the second thing is hunger for Christ leads to true satisfaction and fulfillment in life. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, which Jesus is our righteousness. We don't have any righteousness other than him. He is the righteousness. For they shall be, what? Satisfied. You know, I don't know if you took a poll throughout America and asked, what is it you want in life? You know what would be probably the ballpark answer? I want to be satisfied or happy or fulfilled. That's, I'm just looking for fulfillment or satisfaction. Well, God says the way to get it is to hunger and then be filled. You see, if we hunger after righteousness, then we're going to be satisfied. A lot of people say, well, I'm satisfied enough. Well, you won't truly be satisfied unless you're satisfied with the things of God. Even the Old Testament says this, For he has satisfied the thirsty soul and the hungry soul he has filled with what is good. Say, I'm promised by God that if I'll hunger for him, I'm going to get good. I'm promised by the Bible that if I hunger for him, I'm going to be satisfied. That when I hunger for his son in that manger, that feed trough, when I hunger after him, then I'm going to be satisfied. Bethlehem, the house of bread, the Savior in a feed trough, forever hungering after that Savior. It doesn't start when you're just born again. It continues on for the rest of your life because you've noticed when you were born, when you left the hospital, you didn't quit being hungry. You know, if you're 90, you probably still get hungry. That's the same way with our spiritual life. We just continue on in the hunger for God. And hunger for Christ can be negatively affected by other things. When God put his son in that manger, for us, I believe, to get the picture that we should forever hunger for his son and want 
his son like we want food, like those cows wanted feed. Those cows that were in that manger, they couldn't get to the food because Jesus was in that food trough. They weren't able to eat that day, but the whole world could eat that day. They could feast on the goodness of Christ because Christ was born for us to first hunger for and then to receive. First to taste and then to receive as our personal Savior. You say, Brother Tim, I realize that if I've never hungered, then I've never been born again. Because hunger is a natural process of physical and spiritual life. Yes, and in our walk, Several things can affect our appetite. You say, what are they? I don't want to have anything that would hinder my hunger for the Savior in the manger. What would it be? Well, it's the same thing that hinders your appetite in the physical realm. That's why God makes it simple. He gives such a great illustration of hunger, and that illustration allows us to see it in our physical life. You see, that's why I believe God made this illustration because appetite and hunger is so natural to us, even a kid can understand it. A, a youngster can understand this message because they know what it is to hunger for something. And the same thing that hinders our hunger in the physical world hinders our spiritual hunger. What is it? Snacking. You know, your parents always said, quit eating all that snack before supper. You're going to ruin... Your appetite. See, all our parents went to the same schools. You know, they, they just learned that, you know. Don't eat that now. You're going to ruin your appetite. And even though I may not totally agree with this, you're not supposed to eat the dessert before the meal because you don't want to ruin your appetite. So what happens when you snack a lot and you nibble a lot? Then comes time for the meal and you say, I'm not hungry. I'm not hungry. I've nibbled and snacked so much that I don't have an appetite. I've ruined my appetite. I think especially in this nation with so many distractions and so much entertainment and so much wealth and so much uh, uh, desires and things and games and everything else and sports and hobbies and there's all that out there and nothing in of itself maybe is a sin but it does become a sin when we nibble on those things and we don't have the hunger for God. I've got a career. I've got education. I've got a goal in life. I've got money. I've got a career. I've got family. I've got children. I've got college. I've got things. I've got MPVs and MTVs and phones and cell phones and, and I got all these things or whatever they are and I'm not hungry for God. Well, of course you're not. We have so nibbled on the world, the stomach lining spiritually has no room for God. And you say, I, I just don't know why I don't hunger for God or I don't know why I don't hunger for God anymore. That could be it. God says, put me first. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And all these things shall be added unto you. It's not necessarily that any of that list may have been wrong, but when we put priority on it, and that keeps us from hungering after God. Nibble, 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 nibble. You know, God's saying, you know, you need to quit nibbling all that other stuff. Hunger for me, be satisfied, and then nibble on some stuff. You know, after you're full with the meal, then put that second place, third place. God said, seek me first. Let me be the first to serve you, my Jesus from the manger, the feed trough. Feed on me. No wonder our churches aren't packed like our restaurants are packed. No wonder that we don't have to put out a little thing like that that lights up and goes bzz, 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 so we can let people into church. I'm sorry, we don't have a seat for you right now. It's so packed, we can't put people in the church. But if you'll take this whole thing, we'll buzz you when there's a seat available. Shouldn't it be that way? It should say, I gotta get in there. 
I am so hungry, I don't know what to do with myself. I'll wait for that little bit. And people wait. Some of them leave. I don't, know how, I don't know how far those little things go. I've never tried that. You know, I'll go down the road and go do some shopping, I guess. I've never tried that. But they're willing to wait. And people, two drops of rain won't come to church. You see, hunger. God said, I put my son not in a basket, but in a feed trough. Because I want people to hunger after him. And when you eat on him first, Whatever's else, you know, I'm not saying some of those things aren't good. You know, and God may be blessing you with them. And you can eat on those. You saw why one of the deals that said he was born in a manger, comma, because there was no, no room for Jesus. Huh. That kind of relates to what I just said. There was no room for Jesus in the end. That's why he had to go to the manger. People didn't have room for him. We don't have room in our spiritual stomachs for him many times because of all the other stuff. And God says, you put me first. Whatever it is that you got in your life that's keeping me from being first, get rid of that. I'll replace it with something much better. Do it in faith, and then you'll hunger more for me. And then I'll let you fill up some of that other snacking that's not sinful. As long as you do it in the order that I give it. The other thing is being sick. You know, if you're in my home, you will only hear this statement very few times. Tim, you got to eat something from my wife. You just got to eat something. Put a little something in your stomach. Please? That doesn't happen very often, that conversation to Strickland household. But it does when I'm very sick. Just can't eat anything, just not hungry. When you're walking in known sin. That's spiritual sickness. If you're walking in known sin, you hadn't put Christ first, He's not first in your life, and you've got sin in your life, you'll guarantee you won't be hungry for the things of God because you're walking in spiritual sickness. And what does everybody have to do? Beg you to come to church. Beg you to read your Bible. Beg you to love the Lord. Beg you to do what's right. Why? Just like being sick. You've got to eat something. Come on, please. But your body just rejects food. What you got to do is repent of that sickness. Give it to the Lord, repent of it, and turn back to God. And guess what returns when you start feeling better? I know for me, I want some of that food. I'm hungry. Matter of fact, I'm double hungry because I done spent a day almost eating nothing. And then you know, you said, boy, you're well, aren't you? Oh, I am. How do you know you're well? got an appetite again I don't know if you're back well spiritually the appetite returns the appetite's back there again and you're ready to be serving the Lord corpses don't get hungry and people that are spiritually dead never been saved will never hunger for the things of God they may be religious but they're never going to hunger for the things of God because nobody's ever died and then said, popped up and said, I'm hungry, I need a Big Mac. Because when there's physical death, it ends physical hunger. And when there's spiritual death, which means you're not born again, then there's no spiritual hunger and you have to be prodded, pushed, and everything else. But when somebody becomes born again, boom! Boom! Just like a baby, their spiritual hunger. You know, I was so involved in motocross and all those things and all those deals, and I never thought I could ever hunger for spiritual things. That just seemed un, unexciting to me. But man, when you give your life to Christ, then there's that deal saying, look at me, I'm hungering after the things of God. You see, God changes a person to make them feel that way. You know, you don't go to a restaurant and call the waiter over and, well, you do, and you say, you know, what's, what's on your menu? You know, and, and the waiter may say, man, we've got lobster tonight. Juicy lobster. and We've got this drawn butter that goes across it with a stuffed baked potato with butter and sour cream and green onions. 
or we have the most succulent ribeye steak that'll just melt in your mouth with rolls and butter on the side. It's just great. And, and we've got this molten chocolate cake with molten icing over the top and bluebell ice cream that'll just make you feel like you've died and gone to heaven. <laughs> Three people's already left for lunch, so you know. <laughs> hold on, hold on. And I've never heard anybody say, Amen, brother. I'm leaving the restaurant now and I'm coming back next week to hear you preach another sermon out of that menu book. The waiter would say, what? I said, amen, brother, that was a good message you just preached. Preach it again, brother. And you're leaving? Yes, I just came for the message. You came for the message? Amen, you're about the best waiter preacher I've ever heard in my life. You can make a profession out of preaching out of that menu book, and I hope next time I come, you'll teach and preach another passage out of that menu book. Well, aren't you hungry for it? No, no, I just came in here for the message. You see, our messages are messages from God's Word. But once they're preached, they can be amen, but what they're supposed to be is to say, that makes me hungry to do God's will and God's Word. I think you missed me. Just like here in that menu, all the reason to hear the menu is to get hungry so you'll order it and eat the food. To bring the message is to say, amen, I, that's why I'm making hunger and hunger. I want to get right with God. This is just making me hungry to do God's will. Yeah, I want to come back next week to hear more of the menu book, but it's just I want to eat what, I already, what you've already described. I'm going to take it in. More Jesus. More what he has for me. You see, because I don't know about you, you know, some people don't just eat meals on Sunday. There's people I know that eat meals all week long. <laughs> there are. I've heard of people doing that. Sometimes three. And in some instances, four. But it, they, they eat them all day long. Not just on Sunday. Can you believe that? But you know, some people say, I'll just get what I need on Sunday. I don't get hungry during the rest of the week. Excuse me? No hunger at all? Well, do that with your food. No, no, no. I got to do it with my food because I'm born spiritually. My body hungers for it. Then find out why your body's not hungering for the things of God and to want more of God. That baby that was born, God said, he could have been in a mansion, he could have been in a palace, rightfully so, he's king of kings and lord of lords, God's only son. But I think to make this message is to say, I want the message to be from birth on, He's in a feed trough. Do you hunger for him? Or not? And if not, why not? Is it snacking? Too many other things in your life? Is it being sick? Known sin? Or is it never being born again? To ever start experiencing in the first place? I, I don't know. I just know for me, and all you know is for you, but it'll be one of those three things. That's all it can be. And I think as we approach and we see Christmas and we see the Savior in the manger in the feed trough, I think it's our reminder every time we see that manger. Say, why is it? Lord, what is it that I'm not hungering for your son? more than I hunger for anything else. Christmas, a reminder of the feed trough of which the Savior was born. Every head bowed and every eye closed as you stand to your feet. And we all ask ourselves that question. Why the manger? 
Why the manger? Well, we ask ourselves that personally now. Lord, where is my hunger for you? The reason we give an invitation is for us to all be able to look and see where we are in our spiritual hunger. And today, each of us should draw a circle around our life and right where you are, just ask the Lord. First of all, I think for all of us just to say, has there ever been a time in our life that we gave Jesus our life in exchange for His? We made Him our Lord and our personal Savior, not the Savior of the whole world, which He was. But there has to come a time in our life that we realize our sin caused Jesus to die on the cross and we need to make Him our personal Savior and to walk past our pride and to come to Jesus. We give a public altar call for those, for one reason, to receive Christ. He said, I'd have to step out of my seat and come down there. That'll be the least of your difficulties walking with Jesus. The Bible says, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father which is in heaven. But if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father which is in heaven. We can't stand among other believers. How are we going to stand among the lost? Jesus died openly on that cross. And we're to receive him openly, unashamed. All of us who came to know Christ had to leave our pride behind.